This wind is getting violent. All my things have fallen down. This is what happens when you record in front of the beach. I'm gonna let the wind have its temper tantrum. You control the winds, Lord. I just have a, a paragraph left, Lord. I'll wait. Thank you. All right, I wish I brought a brush. <laughs> this, I hope that this puffer thingy, this little puff ball does its job. Do what you get paid for, you know what I'm saying? Hola and hello, welcome back to Talk to Tally. My name is Tally. Welcome if you've never been here before. This is part of my channel where I speak about the Lord. I speak about the word that the Lord has placed on my heart, or well, I share the word that the Lord has placed on my heart. Today is a very windy day. I decided to turn around because I initially was facing away from the tree, but the sun was coming this way. So I was like, ooh, I love the sun. So even if I look a little crazy, if my hair's getting a little wild, whatever it may be, we're gonna just do what God has told us to do, right? Amen? Today we have, oh my gosh, what episode is it, y'all? Episode 13, Ooh, oh my gosh, 13, all right, let's get into it. We're gonna pray really quick first, and then we are going to get into the word. I hope you've all been well. I hope everybody's happy. I hope everybody's not sick because I'm getting over a sinus thing that literally has been going on for like six weeks. I wanna say thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given me, Lord, to be able to share the word that you've placed on my heart today, Lord. I ask that it be you, Lord, speaking in this moment, Lord, place a filter in front of my mouth, Lord, so only words that you want to speak, Lord, are the ones that come out of my mouth, Lord. All of you, Lord, none of me. Father God, I ask that it be you, Lord, touching the person across the screen in this moment, and let it be you, Lord, encountering their hearts. Let it be you, Lord, changing their hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let it be you, Lord, healing their hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. And let it be you, Lord, teaching us today, Lord, guiding us today, showing us what it really is, Lord, to be a follower of Christ today, and what is the character that we need to have. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm not going to lie. I I actually didn't have a title for this word up until literally when I started driving over here. I know what the word is kind of about and it's about the type of character that we should be having. Lord help my hair today. Lord help my hair. So the word for today is titled the balance of innocence. My God. The best part about it is the fact that innocence really that should be more so the basis of who we are. But the cool thing about this and what we're going to talk about is also the fact that although you may have your innocence, God also didn't call us to be ignorant. He didn't call us to be tolerant. He didn't call us to be stupid, to be honest. He didn't call us to be rugs for people to walk all over either. So I kind of love that. And we're going to see today that love is truth and truth is love. Because I feel like today, nowadays in the world, we're seeing lots of, oh, I can't do this with my hair today. Oh, absolutely not. Lord, Lord Jesus, take the wheel. You know what? I'm going to, hold on. I'm going to take this off because this is going to bother me. So we're not going to do is have me looking a little crazy either. Or let them see you, not me. Amen. I know I had made a video actually um, a couple weeks ago and it was regarding hate disguises love I think it was or love disguises hate. It's talking about how in the world nowadays we need to be tolerant of every, everything. We need to say yes to everything that if you tell your friends you know that what they're doing is correct that that is love. Yes 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 is the answer to everything that everybody is able to have their own way that everything is, is supposed to be exactly how each as individuals we want it to be. That's not the case. A lot of us believe okay just because I am this way naturally because I feel this way because my feelings tell me that this is the truth. My feelings are the truth. And that is not the case. We are going to be looking at some advice that Jesus had given his people. And it'll be kind of more so, um, I would say, Bible study vibes, I guess, for this word. It's not as much a preachy word as it is more so a lesson to learn. I know for a fact that wasn't just a big chunk of that tree that fell off. I know for a fact that's not what just happened. That's a huge branch. As it is more so a... Lord Jesus, cover me. I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. Lord, may no injury come to me. Lord, in Jesus' name, may no weapon formed against me prosper. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. I will speak the word that the Lord has given me. All right, so we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 to 23. I will read it to you, and the word of the Lord is read in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged at the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. Ooh, I love that. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father will his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Ooh, this word is so pertinent to what is happening now in the world. It's actually kind of ridiculous, but it's not really ridiculous. It's biblical. This is literally what he's been telling us is going to occur. People are going to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. People are going to be sought after because of this. People, real Christians, people that are truly children of God, they will have fingers pointed at them. They will have people envying them. They will have people talking about them. And that's exactly how things are structured to be. Because as evil rises, so does the presence of the Lord. And it says so. I actually just posted that. I forgot what verse it is. Oh my gosh, now I got to find it. Hold on. It says so in 2 Timothy 3.13, but people who are evil and cheat others will go from bad to worse. They will fool others and they will also be fooling themselves. Whew. My God, my God. And so that is what we are expecting in these kind of days and in, in these end days, that these specific times, evil will increase while also the presence of God will also increase though. Your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy, miracles will be performed, we will see signs. This is the time where we need to make a difference. But the beautiful thing about this difference that we're going to be speaking about is the fact that there's a balance in it all. People think that we need to be rugs, that we have to be so innocent and so quiet and so kept to ourselves and so stand down ish, right? But that's not actually what he's called us to do. I want to focus mostly on verse 16, which is this is a warning. It's saying, be as shrewd, be as sharp, be as alert, so as to not have fault. Ooh, even when they come at you. Ah, oh, I love that. Because truly, there's going to be times in this walk of faith that we will have moments that we face hard times. And in these times, this is when we should most be hanging on to the hem of his garment. This is most when we should be holding on to what he has told us to do, who he has told us to be, in order to keep us balanced and standing firm in face of adversity. Because it says so in his word that a divided house cannot stand. If you're too shrewd and you're too astute and you're acting too much like the serpent, ooh, my God, you're going to be unbalanced. You're going to lose your equilibrium. My God, if you're too innocent, you're going to let people walk all over you and you're not going to speak the truth that the Lord has told you to speak. Lord. We're talking about two sets of animals here and I put them in four different columns, okay? And so we're going to speak about the sheep first, okay? In Matthew 7, 15, it says, be on your guard against false not real, but false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. These sheep, what's important about this? Knowing that sheep's clothing, okay? Sheep make clothing, correct? Our ch the children of God, we are the sheep of the Lord. So what is it about sheep that you have to know specifically for this word? That when this verse says that they have to be on your guard, it's because there are some that are going to be around you that are going to try to be something that they're not. And when they recognize that they are something that you are, and they're trying to be what you are, people are going to get angry. They're going to want to persecute you. They're going to want to have false witnesses against you and lie about you. Like I always say, the enemy can recognize who a true real child of God is. So if you don't think that the fake can tell the difference between a fake just like them and a real one, you're bugging. So remember in biblical times, especially it still happens now, but sheep shearing is a thing, right? That's how they create clothes. They get fleece out of it. And so something that I thought was really, really interesting when I was studying about the sheep was that they say that the best fleece that came from sheep was from certain parts of their body. So when they would shave off these certain parts, that would produce the best fleece to be able to cover themselves with and make clothes out of. And these two parts were the shoulders and the flanks. So that would be like the sides of the sheep flanks of the sheep that actually covers vital organs just like it does for us this area not only that you know what's so so interesting to me is the way that god truly 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 he speaks through nature how many times do you see that jesus has compared something in the bible to a, a teaching that he wants to make he speaks through nature and so whenever you see in the bible that something from nature whether it be an animal a tree or whatever it is a certain type of plant or water when he's talking about certain characteristics or whatever it may be look it up because there's likely a way deeper message that you never even expected in there some fun things to note about the sheep due to the eye positioning of the sheep right their vision is actually best when they incline their gaze my God, when they incline their gaze and consume the grass, my God, when they bow their head, basically. Okay. And so because of this, they also have scent glands that are right in front of their eyes and also in between the hoof, the toes of their hooves, hooves, uh, hooves. <laughs> In order for them to like walk around, right, and get direction of some kind, they need to touch first. They don't go based on what they see first. Woo! How many of us know that that's exactly how faith works? My God, faith doesn't go by what we see. They incline their gaze first and then they move. <laughs> And they actually depend more so on their other senses than they do their vision. How beautiful. So now when we discuss the wolves, right? The wolves are known as opportunistic predators. Opportunistic predators, they wait for the perfect time in order to be able to attack their prey. And when it says that they are like ravaging wolves, ravaging signifies to cause severe and extensive damage to, 
to us and ravaging what it signifies is to cause severe and extensive damage to. So of course these wolves want to cause some type of severe and extensive damage to us and what God has done for us, what God has said. They do this by infiltrating lies and self suddenly. You ever hear preaching and then all of a sudden it's all about just us and the word of God isn't even mentioned in the last 45 minutes? That's a problem because there's nothing that we can do by ourselves. Everything is through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 because none of it is mine. Hallelujah. Therefore put no God above me because that's the first commandment. Gosh. And that's the thing is that a lot of people think that the enemy would be so obvious. He's not an idiot. I rebuke him in Jesus name. He's not an idiot. He's not just going to blatantly say, hey, I'm, I'm the devil and I actually want you to be fully destroyed. Um, and so I need you to do this. So at the end of all of this, you're actually just going to receive destruction. Make it make sense. So no, he's going to do this thing that it's going to fluff up your feelings. It's going to fluff up your feelings. It's going to fluff up your pride. It's going to fluff up your ego. It's going to fluff up, oh, I feel good about myself. I'm making money. I'm doing these things. I look good. I feel good. I got all these ladies and all these men and whatever it is. He gives you these temporary comforts and makes you feel good in all of it. Oof. It's all a lie because the word says that he only came here to rob, kill, and destroy. Just saying. So if you think that everything is going really, really, really well and that you're believing all these things that go against God, that go against believing in Jesus, because the only way to God and the only way to heaven is through Jesus. So if you're not there, you're actually on the opposite end. I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what extra stuff you say that is from Christ. If it's not through Christ, who is the only one, the one way, the one truth, and the one life. He is the only way to get to the Father, and the Word says so. So if you think any of these other miscellaneous extra stuff has power of any kind to save you, to bring you to heaven, it's a lie. I'm sorry to tell you. It's just, unfortunately, a lot of us love to hear things that make us feel good. And if it doesn't make us feel good, it's wrong. All of us were born with a sin code in our nature. We're all born in sin because of what Adam did in that garden. And Eve. Adam and Eve. I'm not going to blame just one. And so when we say that the enemy only comes to rob, kill, and destroy, yet here are people playing with him. Anyways, people make their own choices at the end of the day. You're going to believe whatever you want to believe. What I would love, I would love to help you and introduce you to the way, the truth, and the life, and the light, and something that's actually going to bring you to heaven. But if you don't want to hear it, that then that's, that's your choice. And that's the thing is many other beliefs can claim all these different things. This is the only one that has been consistent with the evidence that brings forth. And on top of that, it says that he says he is the only one way. The only one way. So if we want to create our own, it's all null. It's all an operant. Kind of got sidetracked. But anyways, wolves. Wolves will utilize their hearing, their smell, and their howl, meaning their voice, to attract prey and watch their prey waiting for an opportunity. They're also endurance predators. So therefore they could actually chase after their prey for long distances, like miles, literally just waiting for the right opportunity. They might take advantage of their prey. They'll like ambush them in certain locations that actually take advantage of the sheep's senses. There is a huge bug. Huh. Go away, please. I don't do well with bugs out. <sighs> go away, go away. Ah! Sorry. They may also ambush their prey in certain locations that actually will take advantage of their prey's abilities and sensory abilities. They may also do this thing where they test their prey. They test them for weaknesses, for vulnerabilities, and they do this by using their own visual cues, their hearing, and their scent. So long story short, what this is telling us is that the enemy gets to know us. They get to know you. They have an eye on you. It says that the most common place that wolves, listen to this, crazy, the most common place that wolves attack their prey is on their shoulders, their flanks, and their snouts. So their nose. The other thing that they use as sensory, right? I'll say, uh, listen, if a wolf is attacking a sheep and he goes after the flanks and the shoulders, my God, this is where the best fleece comes from for the sheep. This, what this is telling me is that the wolves will consume and absorb the best thing about the children of God in order to reproduce and imitate them. And this just goes back to what I said before. He knows exactly what a real child of God does and what it looks like as a result. When you pray a lot, when you fast a lot, when you have an intimate connection with God, what you look like after the fact and the results of it and the fruits that come about, he can imitate and reproduce them. At one point he was even given the opportunity when Moses was there and the Lord was using him to bring the plagues to Egypt. The first two plagues that came to the people, the magicians of the occult side, of the dark side of the Pharaoh, they were able to recreate and reproduce certain things. My God, oh my gosh, I don't want to share this word too early because the Lord gave it to me recently and I don't want to share it just yet. But the only the first two plagues were the magicians able to reproduce and recreate. And by doing this, they were able to deceive others. But then there came the third plague. My God, the third plague 
came and the magicians looked at Pharaoh and said, this is the finger of God. We cannot reproduce it. They can't reproduce it. They cannot reproduce when God takes nothing and makes something. And I'll get into it in another word. Don't ask me for it now, but it's very, very deep. That was a beautiful revelation that the Lord gave me. Thank you, Lord. I give you all the glory and all the honor. What do wolves also do? Oh my God. It's just, I just love it because... It's literally like God says, okay, up until here, you have up until here to be able to deceive these people. But there comes a certain point that you know that you cannot do what I do. Oh <laughs> my God. And so what else do wolves do? They also work together. How many of us know that nowadays there's so much more division in the church with Christians than there is with the enemy? The enemy is more in unity in his world than the Christians in the church. It's so important to be able to study these animals because here's the thing. There are ways that we need to act, but there are also certain things that we need to know about how we should be a sheep and how also our enemies like to play, okay? If you don't know your enemy, if you don't know how to recognize your enemy, then how are you going to be able to fight it? How are you gonna be able to be different from it or from him, whatever it may be? Another characteristic, this is how the guilty the wolves, they tell on themselves, they will attack when somebody is the most vulnerable. My God. And how interesting is it that there's probably many times in this walk that you think that you're actually being vulnerable and you're, you feel unstable, you feel uncomfortable, you feel like I'm not in a good spot. And that may be true. But what if I told you that the most vulnerable position to be in on this walk with God is when you feel too comfortable. <laughs> My God. It's usually when you're doing really, really well. It's usually when you elevate. It's usually when you're like, you know what? I'm actually good here. I don't really need to keep praying. I don't really need to have a relationship with the Lord. I don't really have to fast. I don't have to do any of this stuff. I feel good. We're good. Me and God are good. We're like this. Or was it the works that you were doing that made you feel that way? Because you made a list and you started checking off all these times that you prayed and all these times that you fasted, all these times that you gave to people and it was just a list that you were gonna give to God labor to, to add to your account that you did these things. No, be careful with getting too comfortable. If you feel too comfortable in this walk and you feel always, always at joy, always with, always at peace, always in joy. And I'm not saying because God, he is the God of peace. He is the God of joy. But if you feel like there's never an attack, there's never a fight of some kind, coming at you, something's not right. Because the enemy is not gonna attack somebody that doesn't have a purpose, that is not doing things correctly with the Lord. Because the enemy will come regardless, whether you, whether you feel vulnerable or not, the enemy will come regardless. But it's so much worse when you don't feel like you need to be on guard and alert and astute. Woo! And that's the thing, the real you is not hidden from the Lord. If you thought it was, you're bugging. Because the word says, you see everything, Lord. He sees it all. It's in Psalms, I believe 22.5, I think. Something like that. Some people that thought that they were too comfortable in the Bible were the Pharisees, as we know. They thought that they had it all together. They thought that they knew everything. They knew the word of God. They knew exactly how to act, how to do these things. They knew which rules to follow. And they thought that they were better than everybody else. They were so much more comfortable than everybody else in their position, but they never got attacked. Not until Jesus came along. Woo! <laughs> they worry so much about their outside and how much law that they knew. Oh my gosh. They thought that they were truly the bounty hunters of the Lord. <laughs> Condemning those that didn't follow God's law and doing all these other things. Y'all were guilty. Y'all were literally the guilty ones the whole time. My God. And that's why Jesus calls the Pharisees white tombs. When you figure out what white tombs mean, white painted tombs, it means that they were being deceptive. They used to paint tombs to make them like look brand new, right? But on the inside, it's still a tomb. It's still a grave. There's still death inside of there. My God. What the word is reminding us is that they are opportunistic predators. There are certain things, and this is an interesting thing that you might be like, whoa. There are certain things from our enemies that we can learn. There are certain characteristics and traits that we need to learn to be able to recognize, but also some things that we need to be able to capture ourselves. Because many Christians are sleeping nowadays and they're not astute, they're not alert, they're not awake, they're not paying attention. That's a word of confrontation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I receive it for myself first. I receive it for myself first because there's times where I feel like I need to sleep instead, where I feel like I have to do other things instead. Wake up, wake up. These are not the times to be sleeping, y'all. These are not the times to be sleeping, to be shutting our mouths, to not be sharing the gospel, to not be sharing who he is and what he's done. Are you bugging? These are the times that we need to rise up the most because the more the enemy rises up, the more the Christians are shutting up and they're not saying nothing, they're sleeping. They're paralyzed. This word is telling us that we need to be sharp and alert. Just as the wolves are, so are the snakes. They are opportunistic predators. They try to consume and eat anything that they can overpower. My God. What this is also telling me is that this doesn't mean to be manipulative. This means that we need to take dominion over the things that we need to overpower in this world because he has given us the authority and the dominion to do so. Luke 10, 19, I've given you the authority to trample on snakes. In another word, I forgot where it is, but it says I've given you the authority to stomp on lions and snakes. He has given us the authority. Thank you, Lord. All glory to you, Father, for allowing us that opportunity. Just like them, we need to overpower what the Lord has given us the 
power to overpower. It's not our power. It's everything that he can do. It's his power, not ours. So if you keep on walking in this walk, trying to fight your own fight with your own strength, you're not doing it correctly. My God, my God. So many people nowadays, they're just like, well, I don't really talk to people about my faith. I don't really talk to people about what I believe. What that tells me is that you haven't truly encountered God. What that tells me is that your faith isn't strong enough for you to actually say that it's your faith. I only say this because to call something your faith, you're saying faith, this is your faith, this is what you believe wholeheartedly. This is what you believe in with your eyes closed. I believe in this with my eyes closed. I don't have to second guess it. I don't have to, I have a, I have a certainty about it. I have a conviction about it. I believe with my eyes closed that I still choose this. <laughs> Oh my God. So now when we talk about the snakes, this is the third column here. Snakes, it says to be shrewd. Shrewd signifies to have sharp powers of judgment, to be astute, he also says. Astute signifies having or showing an ability to accurately assess situations or people and turn this to one's advantage. What did I say about overpowering? My God, due to the grace of God that he has allowed us to have the authority to do these things, to take dominion and to also be able to win these fights against the enemy, rebuke them in Jesus' name. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the fact that you're not, walk not walking correctly? Are you afraid of the fact that you don't fully have faith in him? Are you afraid of the fact that you're not really connected to him the way that you should be? Because when you're truly connected to the power that is the Lord, when you're truly connected to the Lord of armies, the King of Kings, what do you have to be afraid of? Proverbs speaks that it's actually intelligent. It actually is wise to receive correction. Are you afraid of the Lord's correction in something? I'm gonna see if I can find that proverb, hold on. I feel like this is a word for somebody because it's not even what was written in my notes. Hold on. It says it in tw Proverbs 12, 1, it says, to learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. My God, Lord, Lord, Lord. Read Proverbs 12. It's a great proverb. Oh my gosh. It was beautiful. I love it. I love it. I love it. Verse 19, it says, truth for words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, Proverbs, I don't know. Proverbs is becoming one of my favorite books, to be honest. <laughs> I love that one. 13, 16, it says, wise people think before they act. Fools don't and even brag about their foolishness. 18, if you ignore criticism, you will end up in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. There's so much more in Proverbs. Definitely, definitely check out those. This tree want to cover me so bad. <laughs> Serpents, they live moving on their bellies, right? They have no choice but to attack from under us. And in the word it says in Genesis, it says, and I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. They see our footing, but they move fast and sneakily. Some things to know about snakes that I was like looking up in my research. This is so crazy. So some things to know about snakes. Snakes don't have eyelids. They sleep with their eyes open because a transparent scale covers their eye. Oh my God. They smell with their tongue and that's why they hiss. <laughs> they hear by sensing vibrations through under their jaw. Oh my gosh. They are sharp because they know when to strike, but also when to be still. Oh my God. This is a word, Lord. My gosh. What does his word say? Hold on. I'm going to get right back into, under the tree. Lord, I'm sorry. I know this like just changed up because I feel like I was getting really annoyed with the sun, the issue. issue. All right. So what does the word say? It says, be still. Psalm 4610, I think it is. It says, be still and know that I am God. We know, we need to know when to strike, but also when to be still. We need to know when to speak and when to be quiet. We need to know when it's time to rest and when it's time to wake up and do something. Lord, my God. When we talk about the doves, it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. When Jesus was baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. We're talking about the innocence of doves here. Doves are the symbol of purity, of peace, of the Holy Spirit. And it says the innocence of doves because they are described usually as, as meek and gentle, that they're not threatening. But it's really, really interesting because if you look for the Greek word for innocent, it's akerai. I don't know how to say it. It's A-K-E-R-A-I-O-I. -E and it means unmixed, simple, sincere, and blameless. And how many times do we hear that the Lord is coming to get a church that is blemish free, that is blameless? Oh my God. Doves are innocent because they do not behave with premeditation, malicious intent, or duplicity. There's no division or double-mindedness in the dove. Oh my God. Whew, that's a word, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And snakes are actually natural predators to doves. Look at that. What this word is reminding you today is that the doves are not stupid though. 
Oh my God. I'm sorry to say the word, but it's true. The children of God are not meant to be idiots. They're not meant to be tolerant. We're meant to be educated. We're meant to be well-rounded in his word and know exactly who he is. We have all the resources here for us in this word. Every single answer to any question that we may have is here. Yet sometimes we still, we still love to confuse innocence with being naive. God, my God. Innocence does not mean ignorance. It doesn't mean tolerance. And when I say this, it doesn't mean that this is like an invitation to be a cynical person, to, to have cynicism. You know what I'm saying? This is a war that is reminding you that there has to be a balance in you. You can't always just be on the offense. You can't always be just looking for a demon to rebuke and always be fighting against. Remember that these things can become idols too. When you focus so much on fighting the devil instead of focusing on God, you're losing your focus. When you focus so much on just, when you focus too much, I'm, I'm reading on the word, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing all these things, I'm connecting with God. But when something arises and you don't want to fight it, you don't want to rebuke it in Jesus' name, you're also letting it walk all over you. Where is your balance? Woo! My God, thank you, Lord. He has not called us to be tails, okay? He has called us to be heads. The word says so in Deuteronomy 28, 13, it says, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail because the head of anything Okay, the head of anything, a leader, the head of an army, whatever it may be, the head of the household, needs to understand how to be able to see all facets, to have all these characteristics of each thing. You cannot be on the extreme end of one or the other. You need to have a balance of each of them. You can't be too soft, but you also can't be too hard. You can't be too open, but you can't be too closed off either. You need to find a balance. Be who he has told you to be. Lord, my God, he is saying, have the qualities of both. It says it. It says it. It's not me. It says the word. It says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as dove. And it didn't say or. It said and. Okay, let's get into this. Let's get into this. Wow, this is good. This is good. What I love about this too is that it says that doves are monogamous creatures. So they don't mix with other birds when they have one mate. <laughs> I love that. They have one mate for life. Therefore, they are dedicated and they are loyal, period. So therefore, if you still find yourself mixing with things of the world, remember that anything that is not of God is against God, is the opposite of God. Oh my God. And what is the opposite of God? It's from the enemy. Check yourself, examine yourself, walk how he has told you to walk. My God, thank you, Lord. A, a character in the Bible that came to mind when I, was, when I was preparing this word that the Lord had given me, glory to you, Father, thank you, Lord, for this. When I was writing, it was bringing me the story of Stephen, the first martyr for Jesus. And I'm studying him right now in my church's Bible study. My favorite thing about it is the fact that he basically was the same typology, um, which is basically like showing like the same image of and study of whatever maybe of Jesus. So he resembled Jesus. OK, but my favorite thing about it was the fact that even in Stephen, even in Jesus, even in the prophets, even in the people of the Lord, we never see people just lying. True true followers of Christ. We don't see just people blatantly lying all the time. Jesus didn't lie. Stephen told the Pharisees the truth. The Pharisees came to him and long story short, if you don't know the story, he was a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay. He was filled with the Spirit of God and he has wisdom and he has truth and he acts exactly how we need to act, but he never withheld the truth. He never diluted it, but he delivered it fervently with a very tough love. He was innocent in the eyes of the Lord. Stephen, even in the end, after they were going to stone him, they were stoning him for the truth of Jesus Christ. And he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Don't find them guilty for this. What did Jesus say when he was crucified on that cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. My God, how beautiful. And if you look at it, everything just points back to Jesus and how we need to act. If you look at the entire Old Testament, the, Jesus says to the Pharisees at one time, you may know the scripture, you may know the word, may, you may know the law. He says it, I think it's in Matthew. He says to the Pharisees, you may know all those things, but you actually did not know me and all of it points to me. So if you start reading the Old Testament, look for Jesus in the Old Testament, please. The framework, the typology, all of it is the same as Jesus. John 5, 39 to 40, it says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now that they know, oh my gosh, that's the thing, how beautiful is that? <laughs> that he told them this, exactly who they were. First of all, you say that you know it, but in reality, you don't know me. And that's exactly what that's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and how beautiful is it that Jesus even said, he said in his word, he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it because he is the law. <laughs> he is it. Everything that you think that you know, he is it. But you just have decided to not recognize him. <sighs> I get hyped up, y'all, but it's true. 
because he's just so perfect. And then he continues to say, John 5, 46 to 47, if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? <laughs> Typology is the study and interpretation of types and symbols, originally, especially in the Bible. The story of Stephen, the first martyr, is found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter six, it starts talking about Stephen. So Acts chapter six, verse eight, it says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. 10 to 11 says, none of them, the Jews, as in the Pharisees, could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. So Stephen was so innocent. <laughs> he was so innocent that people had to conjure up lies about him because they could find no fault in him. What happened to Jesus when he went to go get crucified? Pilate literally said, I have no charges against this man. He only ended up succumbing to what the Jews wanted him to do because he didn't want them to have a riot. But it wasn't because they found Jesus guilty of anything. People have to make up lies about you. Be the type of person, be the type of follower of Christ that people have to make up lies about you, that they have to conjure up stories about you. Be that innocent. So therefore you may be guilty. You may be so guilty in the eyes of man. They may say whatever, but in front of the eyes of the Lord and the courts of the Lord, you are innocent. And I'm not saying that we won't have faults. I'm not saying that we're not going to sin, but remember who you always have to run to when you mess up, the actual judge. Verse 15, it says, at this point, everyone in the high council, the Pharisees, that they thought that they were better than everybody else. I can't stand them. Lord, if I could only punch one of them, Lord. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as angels, Lord. I love this part because truly nothing has even happened yet to Stephen except the fact that they have just been accusing him. So when they look in chapter 6, verse 15, and it says, at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Notice what's going on. All these people are coming against him and bringing all these false accusations against him, lying about him, bringing false witnesses against him. They're all ganging up against him. Yet as they are preparing to hurt him, to lie about him, to persecute him, all these other things, everybody is coming against him. His face shines as bright as an angel's. The glory of God and his Holy Spirit is within him. His innocence was shining for him. And then it says in chapter seven, Stephen, he starts to relate to the council, the council that knows the history. They know the ancestral history. They know the law. They know the scripture. They know all these things. Stephen begins to relate all that history that they already all knew about, but he was relating it to the fact that everything that you know has to do with God, has to do with the one that, that he sent down here, Jesus Christ of Nazareth the one that you guys killed. How interesting is it that he also spoke to them in a way that they understood because when we share this gospel, when we speak the news of Jesus Christ, you also have to understand how to talk to people in a way that they will understand, not manipulate the word, but he knew he could say all these things about the history because he knew that they would understand all of it. It's not like when you go up to somebody now that has no idea what the heck you're talking about and you just tell them about Jesus Christ from the beginning. They knew, they were supposed to know, they were waiting for a Messiah and they had him in front of him and literally killed him because it wasn't how they wanted. They, It wasn't the one that they wanted because it's not how he acted, not how he looked, nothing like that. They wanted their king of armies to be different than what Jesus was. But he's our king of armies and I love him. Oh my gosh, I love him. Ah. Jesus. And my favorite part about the whole thing was the end of it. He related the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and the history that they knew of. And then at the end, he hit them with the harsh truth. Verse 51, this is the cherry on top. I love this verse. It says, you stubborn people, you are heathen, Woo! which that basically means they are uncircumcised at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. They were so mad because he called them out on, on their crap, on their, on their hypocrisy. And so then what happens? The Pharisees, they get mad. They begin to grind their teeth, and then they're shaking their fists. They're like, nee. Like, you know, that old man, like, get off my lawn. Like, they were pissed. I'm sorry, that's the word. That may not be a word I'm supposed to use, but Lord has yet to convict me about that word. Sorry if somebody's offended by that word. They were basically, they were heated because <laughs> they were being called out of being impure of heart. Hypocrites. He was, he was the one that had to speak the truth in his innocence. And not only this, how interesting is it? It's so funny because God's law is also Moses' law. Moses' law actually says, which is the 10 commandments, it says to not create false witnesses. And so not only did the Pharisees break the law that they're so adamant about, that they're so in love with, that they know freaking front to back, but they broke the law during the crucifixion of Jesus by creating false witness against him. But now they're also doing it too with Stephen. 
In verse 55, it says that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 56, and he told them, the Pharisees, he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And they began to cover their ears and they began to they began to yell and shout like demons. I, I swear, I hear this part and every time I, I can picture people covering their ears and screaming, I just literally picture a demon demonic deliverance. They were probably demon possessed, to be honest. That could be just me adding, Lord, forgive me. I'm not trying to add to the word because the word does not say that, okay? This is just my opinion on, on how I picture things. And that's what it sounds like to me. That's just my assumption right and because of that because spirit in the spirit Stephen is seeing that the heavens are opening up and they're seeing the glory of God the demons cannot withstand the glory of God so the demons inside of them probably were were probably seeing this in the spiritual world and could not stand it my God verse 59 it says as they stoned him Stephen prayed Lord Jesus receive my spirit he fell to his knees shouting Lord don't charge them with this sin and with that he died. There has to be a balance in your character. There has to be a balance in your mind, your heart, and your attitude when you're following Christ. Being a believer, being a true child of God, he has never said, hey, child, shut up all the time. Never speak. And the point of all of this is that there is a balance that you need to have in this walk. Be so innocent that people have to come up with lies about you. Be so innocent that people have to search for something wrong and still can't find it. That people have to search for something that goes against your testimony, for something that goes against who God is in your life. Because that's all people are gonna wanna do, that's all the enemy is gonna wanna do is find something to accuse you of to the Lord to make it seem plausible in the courts of heaven. And what I love so much about this word is that if we think that Stephen obviously is the typology of Jesus, I finish with this, Jesus was crowned with a crown of thorns. But listen to this, Stephen, <laughs> the name of Stephen literally means crowned with stone. How did he die, y'all? How did he die? He died by getting stoned. And how beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful. Stephen was our example that someone outside of Jesus Christ could be like Jesus. So what is your excuse? My God. When you look at Stephen, he didn't try to be sneaky and get away from getting arrested. He didn't run from it. He went straight for the head and he spoke the truth. Oh my God. So when you are facing an attack, when you are facing a fight with the enemy, you need to speak the truth of the word and know the word, believe the word. So when you pull it out of your arsenal, it has an effect. If I just quote a bunch of memorized verses and I don't believe in what they say and I don't hold, hold them to me, to my heart, to my chest, to my mind, to my being, they have no effect. They have no weight. They have no power. There's nothing behind them. And it's not that we give the word power because the word has power within itself, all right? I'm not saying that. But it won't do you any good if you don't believe what you're reciting. If you don't believe in what you're reading, if you don't believe in the one that has said it, Lord, 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 because the word of God can stand on its own. You don't have to add nothing to it. You don't have to take anything away from it. The word of God will stand on its own. Even when somebody is not right with the Lord, this is something that my pastor said the other day and I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I love that she said this because I don't hear people saying this a lot nowadays, that the word of God, even if, even if somebody is not right and they're preaching the word of God, the word of God will stand on its own. <laughs> it doesn't need you to defend it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because there could be people that are still preaching the word of God. God and they're not right they are not right but the word of God will still remain true and it'll still stand wow 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 God don't need our help y'all well we need his big time Stephen spoke the truth and then not one moment did he deny his faith he stood on it he wasn't quiet about it my God but just as he was innocent and there was no reason for them to charge him my God he also knew what he was doing he knew who he was talking to <laughs> he knew who was hearing him seeing him watching him he knew that he had an audience Oh my God. There are going to be people, there are going to be the enemy and his little demons trying to watch you and be your audience. They are your audience. So he, on top of also being innocent, he was also astute. He was shrewd as a serpent. Because like I said, he put it in words that they would understand. He spoke to them about things that they would understand that would keep their attention about what he was saying. And then he spoke the truth. And that's the thing, the enemy can't stand the truth. He can't stand to hear the word of the Lord. That tells him that he's already defeated in Jesus name. We rebuke the enemy Lord in Jesus name. There is truth and there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let there ever come a day that you are ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ, of who Jesus Christ in be, is. Because what does the word say? What does Jesus say? Just like my pastor told us in church the other day, she met somebody that was ashamed of sharing the fact that they were a Christian, that they believed in Jesus Christ. And she said, what does the word say though? Never be ashamed because the ones that may be ashamed of me I will be ashamed of them in front of the Father. Don't let yourself get to heaven. And then the Jesus says, first of all, who are you? I never knew you. Second, actually, I'm ashamed of you. So no, you don't get to meet my Father. <laughs> oh my God.
God. My heart would break into pieces, but that's not going to happen, Lord, in Jesus' name. One thing that he can't hear is the truth and the power in the name of Jesus Christ, but another thing that he really can't stand <laughs> is a child of God who won't back down even in the face of adversity because it exposes the lack of authority that he has over us. <laughs> oh my God. The verse previously to the one that says Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, it says that the spirit of the father will be in you and will tell you what to say. What did I read earlier? What did I read earlier? Listen to this. Just like Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord gave him what to say, Look, it says, it says in verse 19, Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, I read it to you guys at the beginning. It says, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Verse 22. Oh my gosh. So that's exactly what happened with Stephen. And that is an account that he's showing us. I keep my word. I said I would be the Holy, I would send the Holy Spirit for you to speak through him. He kept his word and he did it with Stephen. He showed us that he did that with Stephen because the Spirit was with him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of the Father spoke through him. Wow. And how beautiful is it to say that he was the first of many? Not the fact that they died or how they died, but numerous died because of their faith in Jesus Christ and what he did and what they saw. I love it because even in our trials, even when we're trying to figure out this balance of innocence, a balance of having innocence and being astute and not being a rug for somebody to walk on, but also not looking for fights and always trying to obey and all these other things. Notice how he's still always with us and he always goes before us, even in our trials, even in our storms, because he knows it's necessary for him to be with us. Use every day as an opportunity to achieve this balance and to stay alert, to have discernment in these times, it's difficult. Wake up, keep going, keep walking firmly. Let there not be any division in your house, your house, and follow what he has told you. Follow who he has told you to be, follow him. Thank you, Lord. Ah! I love that, that was a word, Lord. Thank you so much, oh my gosh. Thank you, Father God, Lord. I'm gonna pray over these people, Lord, and then me and you are gonna go have a date. Let's pray. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Father God, Lord, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to share this word that you have placed on my heart, Lord. I want to say thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to give us, Lord, the opportunity every single day, Lord, to be able to gain this balance and this character, Lord, to be more like Jesus, to be more like Stephen, how you have exemplified, Lord, for us in your word. Thank you, Lord, because I know from today going forward, Lord, you are going to make things new. Lord, there is going to be a transformation in the person across the screen in this moment, Lord, that is hearing the sound of my voice, Lord. I believe it is done, Lord, and I believe, Lord, that you can do it if they allow you to, Lord. Lord, I ask that you soften their hearts and their minds, Lord. Open up, Lord, their hearts and their minds to you, Lord, to be able to change and refine and clean out and heal the things that you need to, Lord, so they can start walking exactly how you have called them to, Lord. Lord, if they are too meek, too gentle, too quiet, Lord, I ask that you raise their voice, Lord, that they stand firm in their faith, Lord, and that they go forward, Lord, with the authority and the power that you have placed in them all because of your grace and your glory, Lord, because it is your glory, all your honor, all your credit, Lord. And Lord, if they are maybe too loud, Lord, if maybe they're always fighting, Lord, and they don't know how to be still, Lord, they don't know how to be quiet, Lord, and to rest in you, I ask that it be, Lord, giving them the rest that they need, Lord, to continue moving forward, Father. Lord, give them the balance. In Jesus' name, I pray over them. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. All right, y'all. This wind is about to take me. This is crazy. <laughs> Thank you all for spending time with me, and I'm going to see y'all in the next one. <laughs> Bye.